Hello everyone and welcome back to Chemist Tea Time. Today we'll be continuing with electronic structures by learning about electronegativity, bond polarity, and bonding trends. Recall how a number of lessons ago we talked about electron affinity and ionization energy, which are the energies associated to an atom gaining or losing an electron. These concepts are very important when we talk about bonding. In the context of bonding, the ability of an atom to attract electrons is known as electronegativity. Atoms want to form bonds in order to complete the octet, which may cause the unequal sharing of electrons depending on the ability of an atom to attract them. An example of this is with carbon tetrachloride. When we compare chlorine and carbon, chlorine is far more electronegative because it attracts electrons better this would make carbon less electronegative than the chlorines because chlorine only needs one electron to complete its octet. The following table displays the electronegativity values for elements in the periodic table and, are, and it is important to remember these are relative values. Overall, electronegativity follows a similar periodic trend to electron affinity with an increase as you move left to right and a decrease as you move down the periodic table. This means that halogens have the highest electronegativity and group 1 and 2 metals have the lowest. Differences in electronegativity are very important when it comes to chemical bonding and what types of bonds are formed. In bonds where the atoms have a difference in electronegativity of less than 0.4, electrons are shared equally between the two atoms. This is known as a nonpolar covalent bond. The most prominent nonpolar bonds are found in diatomic molecules like chlorine, Cl2, and nitrogen, N2, because atoms will always have the same electronegativity. When the difference in the electronegativity of two atoms is larger than 0.4 and less than 2.0, it makes it so one atom can pull electrons more than the other, forming a polar bond. Since electrons have a negative charge, the atom that is more electronegative gains a slightly negative charge and the less electronegative atom gains a slightly positive charge. This is called a dipole moment because you are inducing a positive and negative pole on a bond similar to the north and south pole. The larger the difference in electronegativity, the larger the dipole and the more polar the bond becomes. We saw this earlier with carbon tetrachloride. Let's look at another example, water. When we look at the electronegativity values from that table, hydrogen is 2.20 and oxygen is 3.44. Based on these values, do you think this molecule is polar or nonpolar? Well, hopefully, when you approach this question, you started off by calculating the difference in electronegativities, which is 1.24. Due to the difference in electronegativities being greater than 0.4 and less than 2.0, this makes this bond polar. Which atom do you think will have the negative dipole? If you guess oxygen, you would be correct. Oxygen has a higher electronegativity, so it has a negative dipole moment, and hydrogen has a positive dipole moment. In cases where electronegativity differences are high, such as in the case of metal-nonmetal, bonds, electrons can be transferred between atoms. We already know this as ionic bonding. This only occurs when the electronegativity difference is about 2.0 or higher. But remember, electronegativity is relative, so we can only use this value as a rough approximation. The last concept we are going to cover today has to do with bond lengths and energies. Bond energy is the energy that is required to break a chemical bond. In general, the stronger a bond, the shorter the bond length. So what determines how strong a bond is? The first and most important factor is bond order. That is whether we have a single, double, or triple bond. In this sense, we can think of bonds as rubber bands. It is much easier to stretch one rubber band than it is to stretch two or three. Bonds work the same way. So we can say that a single bond will have lower energy and these are longer while triple bonds have high energy and are much shorter. So when we look at hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, which do you think will have the shortest bond length? Attempt this question by drawing the Lewis structures. Mm -hmm. 
When we draw the Lewis structure, we see that the hydrogen-hydrogen bond would be a single bond, so it is the longest. The oxygen-oxygen bond is a double bond, so it would be stronger and shorter in length. The nitrogen-nitrogen is a triple bond, so it would be the strongest bond and have the shortest bond length. The other main factor that affects bond length is atomic size. Bonds between small atoms tend to be shorter and stronger than those between large atoms. This is because large atoms have a larger atomic radius, which means the distance between the nuclei must be larger. Shielding an effective nuclear charge also means that in many cases, the bonds are also weaker because the atoms cannot attract each other as well. The following table displays the relationship between bond order and bond energy. The trends that can be observed are those that we talked about earlier. As you increase the atomic radius of an atom, the bond energy decreases. For example, hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen chloride, hydrogen bromide, and hydrogen iodine. You can also observe how bond order affects bond energies. As you increase bond order, the bond energy also increases. Enthalpy is a measurement of energy in a thermodynamic system, with bond energy, or also referred to as bond enthalpy, being defined as the amount of energy required to break a bond in a compound. We can use bond energies to estimate the enthalpy change for a chemical reaction by using Hess's law. This law states the total enthalpy change of the reaction is the sum of all changes. Chemical reactions involve breaking the reactant's bonds and forming new bonds to create the products. The enthalpy of reaction can be determined by the sum of the enthalpies of the bonds broken minus the sum of the bonds formed. If the bonds that are being formed are stronger than those broken, the energy will be released, making it a favorable exothermic reaction. If the bonds that are being formed are weaker than the bonds being broken, which are your reactants, must absorb energy from the environment to react, making this an endothermic reaction. Let's go ahead and practice Hess's law with the following example and determine what the enthalpy of the reaction is and whether it is endo or exothermic. It is important when you practice these problems that you always make sure you have a balanced equation. The first step you want to do when approaching this problem is to always draw the Lewis structures for the reactants and the products, so you can visibly see the bonds that are broken and formed. Next, you want to calculate the sum of the bonds broken and bonds formed using the bond energy table. In this example, we have four carbon-hydrogen bonds breaking and four oxygen-hydrogen bonds breaking. The sum of the enthalpies for the bonds broken is 3,520 kilojoules. For bonds formed, there are four hydrogen-hydrogen bonds and two carbon double-bonded oxygen bonds forming, which is a sum of 3,326 kilojoules. If we plug these values into Hess's equation, the enthalpy of reaction is 194 kilojoules. This is an endothermic reaction because the enthalpy of reaction was positive. In order for this reaction to occur, energy must be added to the system. If we wanted to represent this enthalpy per mole of methane, we would divide it by the stoichiometric coefficient, which in this case is one mole. So our final answer would be 194 kilojoules per mole for one mole of methane. I know we covered a lot today, and I hope you all will go back and rewatch this video if anything was unclear. Thank you for watching Chemist Tea Time, and have a wonderful day.